Cybersecurity is essential to protect electric utilities throughout the world. Cybersecurity is an international issue as cyber attacks have been made on electric utilities in multiple countries. Cybersecurity requires vigilance as threats evolve, as we've seen in the uh, not uh, Petria uh, ransomware attack yesterday. Today we're going to talk about vulnerabilities, strategies to provide cybersecurity. It'll be presented by myself, Cheryl Draffin, and Scott Aronson. This is sponsored by the International Energy Agency, and people from over 50 countries have uh, registered for the event. I'd like to talk about the uh, objectives. First is to understand uh, cyber threats and vulnerabilities of the grid. And as part of that, we'll be presenting four cyber attacks that have occurred to show that, that these issues are of importance. Then we'll talk about another objective is to understand the trends in smart grids that have and their impact on cybersecurity and privacy and data issues. Then to understand some of the US and European and international organizations addressing cybersecurity and wrapping up with cybersecurity strategies. And then we welcome your questions during at the end of the presentation. So I'd like to turn it over to uh, Scott. Excellent. Thank you, Cyril. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are uh, on Earth. Uh, as uh, Fernando mentioned, uh, my name is Scott Aronson. I am the executive director uh, here at the Edison Electric Institute. I also serve as the secretary for the Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council uh, here in the United States, uh, actually here in North America. We uh, bring together the chief executive officers of more than 30 companies and trade associations uh, to work uh, very closely with uh, the governments here in North America to protect critical infrastructure. And it's one of the things I want to, I, I will highlight in a lot more detail later in the presentation, but when you think about the protection of critical infrastructure, that is infrastructure that is critical to national security, to economic security, and to the life, health, and safety of citizens, uh, that is something that both government and industry have a responsibility to do and, and to be as coordinated as possible. So that is very much a philosophy of the uh, electric companies in North America uh, and something that I, I want to impress upon as we go through the presentation. So as you can see on this slide, cyber attacks come in many ways. I want to focus our conversation, again, specifically on the electric industry, uh, obviously with some connectivity to smart grid and smart infrastructure. Uh, but I, I want to level set for people. I think when we think cybersecurity, there are so many iterations of what cyber could be. Is it an attack that uh, takes uh, personally identifiable information from a person, or is it something that has impact on the operations of a company, or is it something that simply obfuscates uh, the uh, the data that is uh, being used, measured, uh, uh, and, and helping to uh, operate infrastructure. I want to focus us on this this notion of IT versus OT. While information technology, in its you know, sort of broadest sense, matters to all of us, when we're talking about national security issues, it really is more on the operational side. The supervisory control and data acquisition, and our ability to operate the grid wherever you may be uh, in order to protect the life, health, and safety of citizens. So while we can look at, at IT uh, attacks, usually uh, they have something to do with a, they have a criminal motivation. Uh, they usually have something to do with theft of money or data or, uh, or um, uh, 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 corporate secrets, uh, corporate espionage, while that all matters to our companies and likely matters to all of you, the duration of this conversation really is going to be focused more on destructive attacks, ensuring, uh, having data and having data assurance. So the other thing I want to say, if you look at the last bullet there, with respect to nation states, and I'll go to the next slide at the same time, 
if you look at this traditional threat matrix, we think of risk to infrastructure in terms of how likely is a thing to happen, that's the Y axis, and then how consequential is that incident, that's the, uh, that's the X axis. If you look up at the top left, very, very likely threat, but very, very low consequence, that's a squirrel. And it could be really any critter, no matter where you are in the, in the world. We've seen impact from birds. We've seen impact from monkeys. We have seen impact from raccoons. In the United States, it tends to be squirrels. And, and I can promise you, at this moment, there is a squirrel chewing through something in a piece of uh, critical infrastructure, meeting his or her demise. And that is not of terribly high consequence to grid operators. It's of high consequence to the squirrel, but it is not of high consequence to grid operators. And it happens all the time. If you look in the bottom right-hand corner, that's where the really scary stuff is. Chemical, biological, radiological attacks, electromagnetic pulses, nuclear war. These are very low likelihood, not zero likelihood, and so therefore they have to be on your risk matrix, but they are not incredibly likely to happen. Yet if they were to happen, they are incredibly high consequence. So that helps you to appropriately put uh, attention, bandwidth, resources into how you are going to mitigate these various threats. So a very simple way to put this is we are looking at ways to protect critical infrastructure from squirrels to nation states. One other discussion about this particular graph, if you break it into, uh, if you break it down on the 45 degree, everything to the top left of the 45 tends to be uh, the responsibility of industry. Um, somewhere in that middle there, you get a combined responsibility, industry and government. And then when you get to the bottom right, you're talking about largely governmental responsibilities. But in all of those, in all those scenarios, we need to be aligned with government. One way I like to put it is we, owners and operators of critical infrastructure, do not have intelligence gathering capability. We don't have a law enforcement responsibility. We don't have a national security mandate, per se. So having the government, uh, which has those capabilities, work with us, and the government, which is not particularly good at operating critical infrastructure systems, uh, having us um, more closely aligned, again, is, is a, a deep philosophy of electric companies in North America. So moving on to the next graph, um, we, we've talked about you know, these, these various um, uh, threat actors. We're talking about squirrels, that's a threat actor, to nation states, that's a threat actor. There's a lot in between. Uh, and so the former director of the CIA, a uh, guy by the name of John Brennan, liked to say that those who want to attack American critical infrastructure can't, and those who can don't want to. And the general theory behind that is one that a, a, a philosophy uh, that folks are familiar with, uh, uh, mutually assured destruction. That isn't static. And what I mean by that is a threat actor's capability is going to evolve over time, and so must we. So talking about threat actors individually briefly, we have near peer nation states who certainly do have some sophisticated capabilities, but again, an act by a near peer nation state is going to have consequences. And so there is a modicum of deterrence, and I'll talk about that in a second. If you take a step down, you have more asymmetric warfare. That is going to be threat actors who maybe don't have as much to lose. And I'm not going to name names, uh, but there are some less sophisticated uh, nation states. There are some slightly more sophisticated uh, terrorist organizations. You take a step down from that. Uh, and you get the criminal syndicates who are very good at what they do. And while their motivations tend to be financial, they are also for hire by some of those other threat actors. 
you take a step down in sophistication and capability from them, uh, and you look at the hacktivists who are usually politically motivated, and then you take a step down from that, uh, and you're, you're looking at the proverbial hacker kid uh, who you know, is really just looking to uh, test his or her skills. So that's where we are seeing some of the threats coming from. One other thing I want to mention is this notion of deterrence. So I, call, I talk about mutually assured destruction. Um, I've had an opportunity to speak to the UN Security Council uh, about uh, six months ago now. As we look at lessons learned out of Ukraine, which did, in fact, uh, uh, withstand a uh, attack uh, on their critical infrastructure. And what the Ukrainians are hoping to do uh, is to take this and show that an attack on critical infrastructure is an attack on civil society and therefore needs a reaction from uh, the international community. Now, there are two ways to deter, and this goes to government industry coordination as well. One way that you deter an attack is that the attack does not have the intended impact. That is largely uh, the responsibility of the owners and operators of the infrastructure um, because if the attack doesn't have the intended impact, well, if I'm the threat actor, why am I going to waste the time doing it? The other way you deter is that the attack has a consequence, and that is largely the purview of governments. So again, one more just example of how industry and government need to be aligned. Moving on to the next uh, uh, bullet, I want to talk about cross-sector interdependency. Many folks look at the electric sector as the most critical. Well, if we don't have water, we can't generate steam or cool our systems. If we don't have telecommunications, we can't operate. If we don't have transportation and pipelines, we can't move our fuel. If we don't have financial services, we don't have access to capital markets, we can't trade our product. So while the electric industry is certainly incredibly uh, critical to all of their, the other sectors' uh, operations, their operations are critical to us as well. So I, I just leave that out there as, as, as something to think about. The last thing I'll say on this slide is, it's something that uh, we have become more mature in the way we speak about it here in North America, and maybe you all are too, but that is we cannot protect everything from everything all the time. So we have something that we call the boom continuum. That is, if you think of a line and you draw an X in the middle of it, that's the incident. Left of the incident, left of boom, is are our activities where you prepare, protect, detect, defend, all very good things to do, to be sure. But because we can't protect everything from everything, we also have to look right of boom at response and recovery. This goes to this level of deterrence. We can't stop all these attacks because they're going to continue. They're going to increase in sophistication. They're, you know, it's the old line about companies. There's two kinds of companies in the world, those who, who have been hacked and those who don't know it yet. So given that we are operating in contested environments, a big portion of our planning is going to mitigating the impact of an incident rather than completely trying to prevent that incident from happening in the first place. So moving on to talk more directly about smart grids and smarter energy infrastructure, I'll simply say this. We talk about the digital overlay that we see as a wonderful thing. It is providing better efficiency, better situational awareness, better visibility into uh, the way that we operate. We're able to deploy incredible new technologies, whether it's distributed energy resources, whether it's distributed generation, whether it's more renewables, all sorts of being more, operating more efficiently, all good things. But with the deployment of these, uh, this smarter energy infrastructure, we are also increasing the attack surface. And so a big part of how we are thinking about this deployment is we need to build security in, not bolt it on after the fact. And if you think about some of the experiences through uh, digital history, if you will, uh, the Internet is a great example of a uh, uh, of a, an endeavor 
It was never meant to be secure, yet we are layering all of this really critical infrastructure on this platform that is inherently insecure. As we deploy more consumer-grade devices that have the capacity to impact broader energy operations, we need to make sure that we are thinking about this deployment in terms of something that needs to be secure. And if it can't be secure, then it needs to be resilient. And I won't go into detail about each of those things that you see on the screen, but suffice to say, I think about all smarter energy infrastructure and all of its capabilities uh, in that, in that, with that philosophy of let's secure it on the front end and let's make sure it's resilient and we can operate it without it if an incident were to happen. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some examples of uh, incidents uh, that have, oh, actually, before I do that, let, let me talk about something that has come up, and I, I'm not going to discuss it in terms of a, of a particular book by a particular author who was a, uh, a famous journalist in the United States, so we'll just leave it at that. Um, but I will say there are folks who look at electric companies as profit-motivated, and so therefore they don't care about security. Well, yes, we are profit-motivated, and so that is exactly why we do care about security. Very simply put, if our equipment is not spinning, we are not making money. More than that, as insurers and credit rating agencies and others uh, and investors look at critical infrastructure operators, as we've seen with Target and Sony and any number of other, and Anthem, uh, which was a health insurance provider in the United States, and all sorts of incidents that have happened all over the globe, the reputational risk to these companies uh, has real financial impact on them. An inability to get insurance, a downgrade in uh, credit rating has real impacts on our ability to form capital and continue to make investments in infrastructure. So yes, we are profit motivated, and as a result, security and the boards of directors who oversee these companies are making security and resilience of this infrastructure a top, top, top priority. Now, I will talk about a couple of incidents. Um, I'm going to spend most of my time on the Ukraine incident because it is very instructive for a lot of reasons. Uh, I will gloss over a few of the others, including some of the recent ones uh, that Cyril alluded to. So I think many folks are familiar. Um, just before Christmas uh, in uh, December of 2015, there were three distribution companies in Ukraine uh, that uh, suffered a loss of ability to control their systems. 225,000 customers lost power for approximately six hours. Let's step back and talk about how that actually all transpired. About 250 days before the attack on December 23, 2015, uh, a threat actor gained access through a fairly sophisticated spear phishing campaign. They were able to then, over the course of those 250 days, do reconnaissance, move laterally through the system, gain increasingly more awareness of the topography of the network, and, and put in place uh, some uh, capabilities to then execute on the day of the attack. Now, interestingly, four companies were actually breached uh, at that 250-day mark, but only three were impacted on the day of the attack. You may ask yourself, why is that? Well, one of the companies actually did see some anomalies on their system, were able to patch their network, and ultimately take uh, action to prevent impact uh, on the day of the attack. The lesson there it needs to be that Sharing information is not just a nice thing to do. It is an imperative 
because had there been a little bit better coordination among the companies that were impacted, it's possible, I don't want to say definite, it is possible that the impact could have been mitigated. The second thing that's interesting about this uh, incident is 225,000 people for six hours. That's not a good day, but that's not a catastrophic day. The Ukrainians did a masterful job at being able to restore their system and operate in a degraded state. This goes back to what I was talking about in terms of left of boom and right of boom. They were able to operate in a degraded state. They had manual operational capability. They basically or they, they, they forewent their, uh, their uh, digital overlay, and they are operating uh, similarly to this day. That is a lesson that we here in North America have taken and are actually developing some capabilities. While we have some, an even more robust capability to operate manually. A couple other types of attacks. So that, that's a great example of a direct attack on critical infrastructure, on SCADA control, and the ability to actually operate. Others may be more aware of the Internet of Things attack that happened in October of 2016. While that did not have impact directly on critical infrastructure operations, it did impact business systems. And I think more importantly, what we saw, what the lesson out of the IoT attacks were is scale. We are now at a point where there are 5.5 million Internet connectable devices being deployed globally each day. There will be 20 billion uh, in place by 2020, and that number is only going to continue to grow at an exponential rate. Given the scale that we are seeing of these devices that are consumer grade, that have almost no security associated with them, that have hard-coded default passwords that are inherently vulnerable, this goes to the point I was making about uh, smart grid infrastructure. We need to think about any smart grid infrastructure that is deployed, even if it is a consumer device, as something that may be able to have impact on operations, which at the end of the day is the thing that we are most concerned with. Moving on to just the last couple of kinds, where you, I think many are familiar with WannaCry. This was ransomware that impacted globally. Uh, we now saw something yesterday that is now known as Not Petia. That's its official title. Um, a, a, a follow-on from the Petia malware, again, has ransomware capabilities. It has a worm functionality, so it propagates on its own. It is beginning to impact uh, operations, again, on the IT side, on the business side, but we are seeing with companies like Maersk and Merck and uh, some shipping, other shippers that even IT side inhibits OT operations. So we need to think about the ecosystem we all operate in a little bit more holistically. And then the last, uh, last um, uh, example is something that came out very recently, uh, Crash Override. This is something that uh, is developed specifically for industrial control systems, uh, has the capacity to be very modular in the way that it can impact uh, electric operations. Uh, and is something that we here in North America are following very closely uh, to ensure that we are patched appropriately, that we are uh, that our, our networks are configured appropriately, so that we can uh, effectively manage uh, this um, uh, new threat. And the only thing I'll say uh, to wrap up here is what you see is this evolution of sophistication. You see this uh, this evolution of capability. And I don't see a stop in that, uh, in that uh, trajectory. There are going to be attacks. There have been attacks. There will be attacks. And there's two things you can do in a situation like that. Curl up and say, can't win, don't try. Or accept that we are operating in contested environments and organize ourselves as in industry, critical infrastructure operators, uh, more uh, uh, organize ourselves to deal with this new world order. 
And so with that, I will turn it over to Cyril, who will talk a little bit more uh, specifically about uh, smart grids. Thanks, Scott. Uh, for smart grids, there's you know, many different uh, concepts of what they are, but they all have a digital, sophisticated interfaces. Um, it could be generation, transmission, distribution, but it has service providers. It has markets, more and more real-time markets. You have uh, on the top left, and the bot on the, on the bottom left, it shows just a, highlights the fact that they're linked. There's two ways in information flow, two ways. Uh, electricity flow, microgrids, and then you also have distributed energy resources. You have customers that want to have more of a control of how their energy is used. You have solar, wind, batteries that are linked together. As you add more and more sophistication, you add more and more complexity, you have various levels of older components and newer components, some of which don't have so the older components don't have as high a level of security and don't even have the ability to upgrade their security. So as the trends move towards smart grids worldwide, you also have a strong degree of complexity. And that complexity, as Scott was mentioning, provides more attack surfaces. You have more data exchange and communications, but that results in more vulnerability. You have the goal for making sure your system is operating effectively. You have service providers that want to maintain the equipment, but some of them have access to the systems, access to the control operations. You have pricing models, so you have more sophisticated markets. Again, people are involved in that time of day pricing in terms of distributed energy resources, and they don't all have the same kind of standards. There's, there's decisions to need to standardize on protocols because there's different regulations. And in some cases, there are no cybersecurity regulations for some of the distributed energy systems. And so this question is, what level of security is sufficient? And as you get more and more complexity, this issue will only become more complex. So on slide 14, there is an array of active management systems that have been deployed. I'll just pick three as examples of what they are and why and the impact on cybersecurity. Electric vehicles are being used in uh, Europe, the United States, and uh, other parts of the world. Well, as they move around, maybe they're just they're carrying viruses with them. If they just plug into one station after another, are they taking viruses along the way? Are they, is there, you have tracking of where they're being used, you have energy spikes, and so not only do you have to control systems, for monitoring them at home or in public spaces, but you have, have potential cybersecurity risks and to the vehicle itself. Um, Synchrophasers are were deployed uh, five, eight years ago in the United States. They basically enable detailed measurement of electricity, maybe 20 times a second. More and more sophistication, but if they get out of sync, if you again modify a system so the frequency of the of the energy flows are not consistent you can have problems in your system and you can take it down. Um, SCADA systems, the supervisory control and data automation systems that people are proud of because they add efficiency and the various types of energy management distribution systems, they all have digital interfaces, digital controls. And each one of them is a mechanism where you can have access and work your way up through the system to deploy malware. And we've seen that deployed in United States and other countries. So what does that mean for smart grid trends? Utilities worldwide need to operate in a more complex environment where they may have less control. You have highly automated demand and control systems with distributed uh, decision-making requirement for real-time communication. And as you move to more and more digital controls, you may not have the abilities they had in Ukraine to operate on a manual basis. You also, you, the advantage of some of the smart grids is that you have more and more sophistication in tracking your systems, and that's important because you need to measure the baseline within band operations. What is the way you should be operating so you can pick up anomalies, so you can pick up 
perhaps some malware or other things that are embedded in your system to red team it and find out what is your baseline system and how is it operating and understand it and have backups to go back to it if it's your control systems are uh, negatively affected. And as you add all these new technologies, sometimes there's a higher risk of vulnerabilities when you interface two systems, when you add smart meters, when you add third-party vendors. And so the very growth of the um, digital complexity and smart grids is also the very thing that adds all these extra interfaces and provide potential weaknesses if people haven't upgraded their security systems and, and settings. There are regulations, but regulations are usually not enough. It requires best practices. And so you have to have organizations that share information on attack in utilities throughout the world to find out these are the kinds of the threats we're seeing, and more importantly, this is what we can do about it. You also have the potential of multiple ways of attack. It's not like a storm or a squirrel that comes by one time. You could have waves of cyber attacks and you're not sure you're safe. You're not sure that they've triggered all the mechanisms that they've buried inside of your system. So when you're ready to uh, breathe a sigh of relief that you've tracked down the, the problems you have in your system, you could have another wave. And so you can't be complacent. You can't be safe. It can't, requires constant vigilance. That's probably the key message. And also there's talking about moving to the cloud. There's, it's done a lot in business purposes, but will that happen in operating controls of utility systems? And what does that mean? Who maintains that cybersecurity? How can you trust the cloud providers? And how can you trust the people that are accessing it? Finally, privacy and data concerns. The, uh, this is a particular issue in some of the Uh, developed countries for privacy, but the question of data integrity is important throughout the world. How do you be sure that the data you're relying upon in your operations is correct, that it hasn't been spoofed? How do you make sure that the, you maintain data integrity of encryption and management because your control systems are usually only as good as the data you're getting, as well as the communications? So let's talk about approaches to cybersecurity. And Scott, do you want to pick that up? Sure. Thank you, Cyril. So I, I've alluded to a lot of this. So I'm going to sort of gloss over it a bit. But we've now told you all the things that are of concern to us. Uh, we may as well tell you how, at least here in uh, North America, we are thinking about uh, approaching uh, this, this new world order. So. We think about grid security in terms of three legs of a stool. The first leg is so if you only have two legs, you're going to fall over. You need all three. That's how we think about it holistically. The first leg of the stool is standards or regulations. And uh, regulations by themselves are not security. They are foundational. They are important. But a really simple way to think about it is if you tell me I have to put a 10-foot fence around everything, the adversary simply brings a 12-foot ladder. Now, we want to make them bring that 12-foot ladder, but let's not pretend that if I do X, Y, and Z, I am secure. Um, here in North America, we do have mandatory and enforceable cyber and physical security standards, and that's great. Uh, and we really do actually appreciate them. It is a uh, foundational level of security that we're able to achieve because of those. Then, though, because standards by themselves don't equate to security, you need a more dynamic response to a more dynamic threat. And this is where industry-government partnerships come in. I referenced before the Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council, or ESCC. Very long story short, this, in North America what we've done, and in the United States specifically, uh, we have identified 16 critical infrastructure sectors. Each of those sectors has a sector coordinating council whose responsibility is to partner at all levels of government, uh, including internationally, uh, which is why I'm privileged to do this call today. Uh, doing that level of, of coordination, uh, the, the electricity subsector, which is a subsector of the energy sector, 
uh, is actually held up as one as the model for how to bring critical infrastructure operators together with government because we have, as I referenced before, 31 CEOs from across North America, all segments of the industry, so investor-owned, municipally owned, cooperatively owned, Canadian entities, independent power generators, the nuclear sector, the gas sector, and on and on. All of these CEOs come together three times a year. We don't just pat each other on the back and say they're doing a great job, but we are, in fact, doing things that are advancing the cause of security. And I will tell you what those are two slides from now. The last leg of the stool is what I referred to before. Because we cannot protect everything from everything all of the time, we are preparing to recover, respond to and recover from any number of incidents. That means having enhanced resiliency, no single points of failure, the ability to operate in a degraded state. That means mutual assistance. Uh, and that's something uh, I don't know if it's uh, international, but I do know here in North America, when there is an incident, if there's a storm, for example, companies from all over North America will descend on the affected area and help the company that was impacted. After all, we are all operating one big machine. So it is in everybody's self-interest to work together to keep that machine operational. And that then also includes spare equipment sharing programs and other uh, sharing regimes that help us to keep this really big machine operational. Um, we talked about regulations before. These are different standards bodies, organizational bodies. I won't go into the long uh, history of how uh, the United States ended up having this electric reliability organization, uh, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. But suffice to say, NERC, uh, they, their responsibility is to write the standards with input from owners and operators. Uh, and FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, a regulatory body in the United States, has the authority to um, uh, enforce those standards. Failure to comply can come with fines of more than $1 million per infraction per day. So again, suffice to say, there is a lot of economic incentive to be compliant with these standards. Um, in addition to for enforceable regulatory standards, uh, something that I know has taken uh, root uh, globally is the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, uh, critical infrastructure uh, framework for cri improving critical infrastructure. That framework has given us a common taxonomy, a common lexicon, not only within the United States. So the NERC and FERC standards map to the NIST framework, but it actually allows us to have this common taxonomy globally and has been a very effective uh, way to work across uh, the world to improve uh, the, uh, to improve cybersecurity. So we can talk about that more possibly in the Q&A, but in the interest of time, I will move on. I did want to just refer to a little bit of the um, uh, initiatives uh, that uh, the uh, electric industry in the United States or in North America has, has undertaken. I said the CEOs who meet three times a year aren't just patting each other on the back and saying we're doing a great job, but we are doing things that are enhancing security of the infrastructure. What, rather going into all the initiatives, I'll simply break it down into four buckets or four categories of work that we are doing. The first is tools and technology. That is deploying uh, tools that give us better situational awareness. Um, I like to say the government here in the United States has some pretty cool toys, uh, and we would like some of those on our systems to improve our security. The second is information sharing. That really means making sure that the right people are getting the right information at the right time. CEOs need a certain class of information. Uh, operators, the people who actually can do something about it, need actionable information. And then, actually, you know, when we're talking about cyber, getting people out of the equation entirely and doing machine-to-machine -machine information sharing, which again goes back to tools and technology. So tools and technology, information sharing. The third is cross-sector, uh, working across the interdependent sectors so that we can uh, harmonize the people, the processes, the technologies uh, that ultimately make us all more secure. And then finally, 
it's that last leg of the stool. It is, it is looking at uh, response and recovery activities, whether it's enhancing spare equipment sharing, whether it is uh, improving mutual assistance capabilities. Uh, just in the last year, we developed a cyber mutual assistance capability. Um, more than 100 companies representing more than 80% of all meters in the United States uh, are members of this program. Uh, and it's a capability to share people, equipment, knowledge uh, in the midst of cyber incidents and, in fact, has been used uh, in, in particular with response to the uh, Dyne uh, attack, uh, IO, the Internet of Things attack back in October, and more recently uh, response to the crash override uh, malware discovery. So that should give a pretty good uh, uh, overview of how the United States and how North Americans have organized themselves as an industry and with our government partners uh, to better enhance our security. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Cyril for uh, some of the more international focus. Thanks. Uh, in Europe, there's a number of activities that started uh, last year with the winter package. Um, the European Commission uh, Acknowledges cybersecurity. There's been an emphasis on smarter and more efficient management of the grid and innovation. It also points to the importance of cybersecurity for the energy sector and the need to fully assess cyber risks and the possible impact on the security of supply. It has a, uh, measures to prevent and mitigate the risks as well as the adaption and adoption of technical rules for electricity, uh, essentially a network code for cybersecurity use. So they're taking steps to address cybersecurity. And then there is a um, expert cybersecurity uh, working group that has uh, focused on 10 cybersecurity challenges in the energy sector, uh, including the effects of cyber attacks um, and how to handle them within the European Union. And there's effort among the various countries as a follow-up to take their own individual steps and to coordinate that. So there's movement towards taking some of the models that have worked in the United States and applying them in Europe. And as you go internationally, there's a desire to have the individual regulatory authorities and governments throughout the world also use the, the cybersecurity framework and some of the tools and some of the regulatory approaches, and most importantly, the best practices, to strengthen their electric utilities. And so there's some efforts by governments. There's also efforts by the International Electrochemical, Electrotechnical Commission, um, IEC, to come up with technical standards, and IEEE to come up with technical standards in cybersecurity that can be used worldwide. So it's the professional associations are also joining in to address these kinds of issues. So as we look for strategies to address the cybersecurity vulnerabilities, we start with risk management. We talked earlier about the consequence and likelihood trade-off, and you need to look at the risk and prioritization. What's most important to your electric utility, no matter where you are in the world? You know, what does it take to maintain operations of your utility? What's the most important parts of the grid you need to maintain? to understand what the vulnerabilities are, to understand what your software is, where the patches are, whether there's a control system. Do you have a, a central location where there's a cybersecurity expert and a control system for monitoring your operations throughout the world? But it starts with risk management. What's the worst thing that could happen? How do you guard against that? And how do you prioritize your resources? In information sharing, We've talked about that before, and standards, also cost recovery, how to justify it, and workforce education and training. That's part of the package of making sure you have people understand what the risks are. So now we're going to talk about um, the, uh, just as intuition of risk management. You know, we talked earlier about assessing vulnerabilities, threats, and impacts, reducing the vulnerabilities, preventing the attacks, essentially it's before the boom and after the boom, and how do you maintain um, good situational awareness, and how do you have a response and recovery program that you've thought through? How do you maintain operations or bring operations back in your electric utility if you have been hit? 
And as you've seen in Ukraine, you know, it happened in 2015, it happened in 2016, in December, it happened again. Um, you know, you need to be ready for these waves of attack and how do you respond and how do you recover. We've already talked about information sharing. There's not a magic bullet that stops all cybersecurity attacks, um, but you need to be mindful and you need to share cyber information. There's been a lot of a good coordination work in the United States. They're moving in that direction in Europe. Now the question is how does the rest of the world share their information regionally? And these are some examples which you can look at later because you can download the, uh, the webinar at a future date to see some of the things that are happening. And I would just say, uh, you know, we, we've talked about the value of information sharing. To me, it's a phrase uh, because it was such a part of uh, some policy debates that kind of lost meaning here in North America. Uh, but, but I will say there is nothing more important than uh, infrastructure operators working closely across sectors, um, across nations. Uh, here in the U.S., we, we look at it a federal, as a federal issue, but at the state level also, and then international. So we have this obligation. Uh, I, I talk about it in terms of north-south between industry and government, so up and down, and then east-west across all the critical sectors, all the units of government, all of our partners uh, in the vendor community, these are ways that we can be better prepared for the eventuality of an incident. And there's things like in the United States who are uh, grid acts, which they get utility executives and government people together. They've done it multiple times. They're going to do one in the fall this year to be ready to talk through how you handle these things, not just from a technical, but also from a management um, aspect. Yeah, you know, the, I didn't say it before. The uh, ESCC, its sort of motto is unity of effort, that is working together to protect our systems and to respond if something happens. Unity of message, that is to work together both before something happens and after with the general public, with our customers, to begin to sensitize people uh, to the need to be prepared uh, for uh, these sorts of attacks uh, that could impact operations. And the same thing you've done in cyber Europe um, in their activities. Um, so we talked about the regulations and best practices. Those are important both for There's also a question of how much expenditures are enough right. um, in terms of understanding the range of costs, you know, who pays for it, what's the value received. Um, there are regulations in the United States for, for bulk energy, but not for distribution. And so there's a constant challenge that people have is how much is enough. You know, and, and this is, there's, there's no easy answer to this. I, I think these are thorny policy questions, uh, but we have found a, a couple of things. The, again, I, I really tried not to use a, an American colloquialism, but I'm going to anyway. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And what that means is if you are not working with government partners, uh, then it's an adversarial relationship between the operators of infrastructure and uh, those who can more ably help us to protect. But if we're working really closely together, uh, then there are, we can have more mature discussions about uh, these, uh, about how do you resource this? What is the appropriate cost? Who bears that cost? Uh, and, and, and you can talk about uh, are we going to spend our money on security, that is higher walls, more guards, guns, and gates, better firewalls, all of that, or are we actually going to assume and allow some risk, which is okay, but we're going to focus more of our attention, therefore, on resilience and the ability to recover. And that's a mature conversation that, that's harder to have if it's a policymaker who's saying, why aren't you more secure? Well, sometimes there are diminishing returns at you know, the amount of money that you spend on security. Finding where that place is and, and then ultimately spending money uh, instead on resiliency and recovery capabilities may be the better strategy. And unless you are talking and working directly with policymakers, uh, it, it, otherwise you end up in a position where you need to be more secure, you need to be more secure, why aren't you more secure? And, and again, sometimes given the nature of these threats, there simply aren't big enough firewalls and good enough security measures to implement. 
so having that having that uh, that thoughtful debate uh, with policymakers is, is something that we have found great benefit in. So to conclude, uh, cybersecurity threats and grid vulnerabilities will continue to evolve for many decades. Um, cybersecurity risks must be addressed by the entire worldwide power industry. The increased digitization and interfaces increase cybersecurity risks. Data integrity and protection are important. Cybersecurity standards and working groups and resilience and some of the things that Scott just was talking about is important to prepare for in advance and also to respond afterwards. And the, the final message is cyber risk management is needed throughout the world. So we'd be happy to take questions.